If you're looking for something to tell people today that happened at church who weren't at this service, you can say, Diane was hit by a bus. Because <laughs> it hit her foot as they were coming along, and I thought, you know, people, what? What? She was what? About a month ago, I went to the Western Pennsylvania Conference Center to meet with our bishop, Tom Bickerton. Bishop Bickerton worships with us on a regular basis. When he has no place to worship, this is where he comes. And um, I hadn't been to the conference center for two years or more. And when I walked in the door, I noticed some renovations had occurred. There was a new welcome desk, and, and there was fresh paint everywhere. Painted on the wall to be seen by everyone as they entered the door were these words. Our, our core value is love. Our core value is love. When I saw those words, I was reminded that maybe, I don't know, six, eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago, perhaps more, perhaps less, our conference, which is the organization that includes all of the United Methodist Churches in Western Pennsylvania, that means all the churches from the New York border, the bottom of the New York border to the Maryland border, the West Virginia and Ohio border, over to um, Johnstown, but not including Altoona. That's the Western Pennsylvania Conference, which probably includes about 800 churches, give or take. Anyway, that organization decided to develop core values for our conference. Effective organizations and churches have core values. They are guiding principles and non-negotiable beliefs that remind them of who they are and what they believe. You may remember, if you were here when I came here, that we had core, va core values. We had four of them, and they hung on banners near, uh, near the windows. Within a year, that list had expanded to 11. That was partially my fault. Because I felt like our core values needed to be significant, needed to significantly state what we believed and what were the drive, driving influencers in our, in our ministry. And so we have a core value now that emphasizes the authority of God's Word, the Bible. And we have a core value that mentions that we believe that small groups are essential, that they are life-giving to building faith and relationships. And we have a core value that says that people who do not have a relationship with God, therefore they are people who are distant from God, are still important to God, and therefore they are important to us as well. And we have a core value that says that we believe that Christ followers, Christians, strive to be authentic Christians, and we long for continuous growth. As I said, we have 11 core values. So when the conference decided they were only going to have one, I thought, well, that's not enough. We need more than that. These core values serve as reminders of who we are and what's important to us and what we are trying to be. We need to be reminded of more things than just love. I'm older now. A little wiser, I hope. And the more I study Scripture, and the more I learn about God and the life of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit among us, within us, and through us, the more I recognize that the fundamental nature of love is present in everything. You could ask lots of questions about God and the Christian faith, and the answers to those questions could be quite verbose. But in a way... The answer to many of those questions could be one word, love. Who is God? What is God? How would you describe God? Love. 1 John 4.16, our scripture for today, God is love. Why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Love. He loves us. And he wants us to live in peace and in harmony with one another. What is the most important commandment? Love. Love God. What is the second most important commandment? Love. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Why did God send his son to the earth? The answer is love. Why did Jesus die for our sins? Love. Why did God send the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to guide us? Love. Why are people nice to me when I enter this church? Love. 
Why do people give to the church? Love. When I'm driving in my car and someone does something that upsets me, why should I let that go? Love. Why should I be nice to strangers? Love. Why should I forgive people when they hurt me? Love. Why should I be patient? Love. Why doesn't God ever give up on me? Love. Why did Jesus give us the church? Love. Why does Jamie Petrick bend over backwards to make people feel welcome and important when they visit our church for the first time or whenever they come through the door? Love. Why do Russ Gibson and Darlene Bridewieser and John and Tammy DeBonis lead the confirmation program every Sunday of every week for nine months of the year, year after year after year after year? Love. Why does Jim Mountain lead a Sunday school class for teens? Love. Why do people work in the nursery? Why do they teach children? Why do they vacuum the water out of the basement when the basement floods? Love. Why do people work so hard and do such a good job on our staff when maybe they could make more money doing something else someplace else? Love. Why does Carol Aberly and her team prepare funeral dinners every time, their funeral luncheons, every time there's a need for one? The answer is love. Why does Cheryl Heisey and Jan Brooks take dinner to the kids at Bethany House twice a week, every week? Love. Why do people volunteer? Love. They love God. They love others. So friends, love is the core value of our faith. God loves us. We love God. We honor and obey and serve God as our response in love to God by loving others. And love is the core value of the church of Jesus Christ in the world yesterday and today and tomorrow. You could ask the question, hey Jesus, how should I respond to this or any other particular situation in life? And you could pick a situation, whatever the situation may be, and Jesus' answer we could safely assume would be love. You respond in love. Let love be your guide. Love is essential. Love is fundamental. Love is primary. Love is at the heart of the gospel. Love is the central message of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So with that understanding of love, we turn to this final ingredient that Peter encourages us to possess as we strive to enjoy a stumble-free walk with God. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you do these things, you will never fall. Faith and goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, kindness, and love. We've spent eight weeks eight Sundays this Sunday, gaining a deeper understanding of each one of these ingredients. Love is the one that holds them all together. Love is the glue. Love is, the, is at the core of these actions. In preparing for this series of messages, I read a book. I read a book. It's called Able to Stand by Daryl Donovan. And in his discussion about love, he references the fruit of the Spirit mentioned by Paul in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. You probably know them by heart. At least some of you do. You remember them. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Now, Donovan offers an interesting bit of insight into this list of fruit. He suggests that Paul mentions love as the main fruit, and then the other fruit listed are actually further definitions or further manifestations of love. And so according to Donovan, it is as if Paul is saying the fruit of the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives is this incredibly profound sense of love which is experienced and or expressed through 
joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. If you love something or someone or some situation enough, you desire to practice those, right? Sometimes children, when asked to draw something or someone that demonstrates love to them, will draw a picture of a grandparent. They don't know enough to say, well, it's because they express love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control when they are around them. But it just so happens that such qualities are precisely what they experience in their grandparents, right? Patience. Shoot, what parent? shows patience to their child, but the grandparents and kindness and gentleness and goodness. Now, Donovan, Donovan then, in stating his case that the last eight fruit of the Spirit are expressions of that first fruit love, then compares Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5.22 to what Paul says about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Remember that section of Scripture? We call that we call 1 Corinthians chapter 13 the love chapter of the Bible, right? It's the number one scriptural choice for weddings. It's introduced by Paul with these words found at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 at verse 31. And Paul has spent much of Corinthians, almost all of Corinthians, talking about the church, talking about relationships, talking about how the church ought to be. And then he gets to chapter 12 and he starts talking about all the fruit, or not the fruit, the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 teaching and administration and, and exhortation and all of these wonderful gifts. But then he comes to the end and he gets ready for chapter 13 and he says, and now I will show you the most excellent way. It's almost as if, if you didn't have enough time, just start. At, verse thir at chapter 13. And then he begins chapter 13 by saying, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal, and so on and so forth. Which means whatever we may do in the name of God or in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the church, if it's not based on love, it doesn't matter. Remember that litany of things I read to you about why does this happen? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And if you read through chapter 13, my favorite part, I think the best part is found in verses eight through, 4 through 8. That's where Paul describes love. He says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love never fails. Those are my favorite words in the whole chapter. But now for the comparison that he makes. The fruit of the Spirit is love, which results in joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. But he takes them and he sets them up and puts one against the other. So he says, here, here from Galatians chapter 5, 22, and you can look at the screen, you don't have to look at me, but um, joy, joy and peace and patience, those come from 5, 22, Galatians 5, 22, and to the right are phrases that come out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Joy, love rejoices in the truth. Peace, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Patience, love is patient. Kindness, love is kind. Goodness, love is not rude. Faithfulness, love always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. Gentleness, love does not envy, it does not boast, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, self-control. Love is not self-seeking and is not easily angered.
You see, friends, love enables us to walk without stumbling. Because love leads us to live life differently, better. Love enables us to give ourselves each day so that we might enrich, so that we might be a blessing in the lives of others. Love enables us to hold a firm commitment to walk in a nurture-giving relationship with others. Love enables us to humbly approach every person for the, the precious creation of God that they are, made in God's image. Love enables us to walk in obedience to Him, relating to one another as, as we would relate to God. Love enables us to fill our lives, seeking ways to express the love that is in us. All the principles, all the ingredients that Peter has given to us have no worth if they are not motivated by love. If love is not our driving force as we walk with Christ, we will, in fact, stumble and fall. There comes a moment in each of our lives when our faith in God comes alive. That moment happens when awareness of God's love for us suddenly enters our lives. We may spend major portions of our lives not really understanding the true nature of faith and the essence of our relationship to God. And then suddenly, suddenly the scales are removed from our eyes and we can see, and, and we see it's about love. It's all based on love. Whatever God does... And once we understand how deeply God loves us and how much God has done for us, then there is this desire that grows inside of us to respond to God's love for us by loving God in return. God then invites us to follow him, to walk with Jesus, God's Son, and to join Jesus in leading a love-based life. Love-based living sees the world through a different lens and it lives accordingly. We know that when Jesus dwells at the center of our lives, life is better. And the reason for that is that we then begin to follow his example. We begin to obey his teachings and we try to walk with Jesus as we live our lives that are based on love. The better life is one in which we live life with Jesus at our side. We can live that life. We can walk that journey without stumbling or falling if we will cling to faith goodness and knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, kindness, and love. That is what Peter says. And the greatest of these is love. That is what Paul says. Love-based living. That's the way of those who love God and seek to follow Jesus. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love.